Norman Smith was the man behind the desk for nearly 100 Beatles songs. He helped guide an early experimental Pink Floyd and was one of Abbey Road's main engineers for over a decade. Working with artists such as Jerry and the Pacemakers, The Swinging Blue Jeans, Helen Shapiro, Billy J. Kramer, Manfred Mann and Kevin Ayers, Norman also produced one of the first rock concept albums, SF Sorrow by Pretty Things. Nicknamed Normal by John Lennon due to his unhurried, unflappable and amiable nature, he's often overlooked as a big influence on the world of British rock music. So this is the incredible story of a legendary engineer, producer and unlikely pop star. Norman's early adult years were dominated by World War II when he served as a glider pilot in the Royal Air Force. But throughout his teens and early adulthood, his life was dominated by jazz as he tried his hand at writing his own compositions and primarily playing trumpet, but also drums, piano, vibraphone, trombone and stand-up bass. Struggling to really get his career off the ground, he applied for a job at EMI after seeing an advert in the Times in 1959. The ad clearly outlined that EMI were looking for apprentice engineers under the age of 28. The 35-year-old decided to lie about his age, and at the interview, his cheeky criticism of Cliff Richard, the label's rising star, appealed to his interviewer and helped Norman stand out amongst the hundreds of applicants. He was one of the three apprentices hired on the spot and began work at EMI Abbey Road Studios. Norman said this about his early career. I had to start right at the bottom as a gopher, but I kept my eyes and ears open. I learnt very quickly and it wasn't long before I got onto the mixing desk. In those days, every prospective artist that came in had to have a recording test. And that's what we started doing as engineers, because we couldn't really cock anything up. Normally, each of the producers at EMI had their own assistant, and they would be the ones to keep an eye on the potential talent. And that's what I was doing one day when this group with funny haircuts came in. By this stage, Norman had progressed to balance engineer and was responsible for auditioning most of the new bands that came into the studio. By the time the Beatles walked through the door in June 1962, he was very much responsible for their test recording, Norman said. The Beatles didn't make a very good impression apart from visually. I mean, we heard nothing of John and Paul's songwriting ability. They had tiny little Vox amplifiers and speakers, which didn't create much of a sound at source. Of course, every sound engineer wants some kind of decent sound at source that he can then embellish and improve. But I got nothing out of the Beatles' equipment except for a load of noise, hum, and goodness knows what. Paul's was about the worst. In those days, we had echo chambers to add reverberation, and I had to raid the Studio 2 echo chamber to get the amplifiers in order to fix them up with a sound so that we could get something down on tape. Despite these difficulties, the band made an impression on Norman, and he offered his positive opinion to producer George Martin, who was unsure about them musically. The band's humour took them a long way, as when asked if they had any concerns about anything, George Harrison looked at George Martin and replied, Well, for a start, I don't like your tie. This irreverence sent the engineers into roars of laughter and a legend was born. Norman had a significant part to play in the sound of the early Beatles records. By way of how the band was set up in the studio and the acoustic impact this had on the recordings, Norman said, Up until the time when I became a sound engineer, the other engineers would always use screens. Everything was screened off so that the separation was good on each mic. But I didn't like that idea for the Beatles once it had been decided that I was going to record them. I wanted them to set up in the way that they'd looked, in line with their attitude and how they approach things and it seemed to me that they would be far happier if they were set up in the studio as though they were playing a live gig. I therefore threw all the screens away, and the Abbey Road management warned me that I was taking a bit of a chance. But the Beatles performed as they did on stage, and although the separation on each mic wasn't terribly good, it did contribute to the overall sound. We also got a bit of a splashback from the walls and the ambience of the actual studio, and in my view, this helped create what the press dubbed the Mersey sound. I'd received phone calls and letters from America asking how I managed to get all of that sound on tape. And we all got on so well. They used to call me normal and occasionally 2DB Smith. Because on a few occasions, I would ask one of them to turn his guitar amplifier down a couple of decibels. Norman had been playing the drums and other percussion instruments since the age of 16, so was well acquainted with them. When the Beatles were recording Hard Day's Night, Norman really felt that the recording would benefit from some bongos being overdubbed on top of the drums. But as Ringo had never actually played them before, Norman gave him a quick lesson on the basics of how to hold them and the fundamental striking techniques. Ringo did give it a go, but it was clear he wasn't getting it. So Norman ended up playing the part himself, which you can hear giving the track a really good driving feel. For some, the sound of the early Beatles records reached its zenith on the album Beatles for Sale, and it's hard to argue with them when you listen to the clarity of the album. The same can also be said of the sound of Rubber Soul. The recordings have an intimate feel and warmth that draw you right into the songs. In February 1966, Norman was promoted to EMI's A&R department 
taking the role that George Martin had previously worked in as head of Parlophone, and it was at this point that he parted ways with the Beatles, Norman recalls. Rubber Soul wasn't really my bag at all, so I decided that I'd better get off the Beatles train. I told George, and George told Brian Epstein, and the next thing, I received a lovely gold carriage clock inscribed, to Norman, thanks, John, Paul, George and Ringo. It was the following year he saw Pink Floyd play at the UFO Club in London and decided to sign them. Their music did absolutely nothing for me, he conceded. I didn't really understand psychedelia, but I could see they did have one hell of a following even then. I figured I should put my business hat on, as it was obvious that we could sell some records. He produced their first, second and fourth studio albums, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, A Saucer Full of Secrets, and Amogama. During the sessions for the song Remember a Day, drummer Nick Mason became agitated that he couldn't come up with the right drum part for the song. Norman, however, knew what he wanted, so he played the part himself. Norman also wasn't shy to add his voice to harmony parts either. His role as Pink Floyd's producer slowly diminished over time as the band became more proficient themselves around the studio, but they were very appreciative of his early guidance in the studio. Here is Nick Mason and Dave Gilmore recalling their experience with Norman. Norman was an excellent engineer and had worked with the Beatles. And so I think the idea was very much that in the way that um, George Martin had become the producer for the Beatles, that Norman would now be taken from engineering and become the producer for the new Wonder Band. And I think he was terrific for us for that period because he was a little like George. He was a musician and he did have quite a lot of input. He can quite often be heard on harmony vocals and on backing tracks. He could certainly lay out a chord sequence, suggest different instruments and so on. He was very happy to teach rather than uh, protective in any way. So I think we all have fond memories of Norman until the point at which we then really wanted to uh, fly on our own. And I think there was a point at which Norman really wanted to stick to the sort of, the, I'd say, the pop song concept, whereas we wanted to head off into new territory. It was always understood that we wanted to be involved and learn. First of all, Norman had been an engineer for the Beatles, so he absolutely understood that the artist should be allowed into the control room. I have to say, there was a certain school of thought at Abbey Road at the time that artists shouldn't be allowed to meddle. And I was reprimanded on one occasion when we were doing Umaguma, uh, where someone saw me actually with my hands on the faders. It was a gradual transition, really, I think you could say, between there being a producer who actually really did take charge, because Norman Smith sort of took charge, but um, he was very, very open and willing. And uh, while we did sit around in the actual studio room being musicians, and he did sit in the other room being the producer, there was a lot of jumping to and fro from one to the other and adjusting things. And um, he gave us a really good sort of initial instruction into how all the studio stuff worked. In the middle of the Pink Floyd years in 1968, Norman also produced one of Rock's first concept albums, SF Sorrow by Pretty Things. As it became less needed by Pink Floyd, Norman decided that it was time to emerge from behind the desk and onto the stage himself. To go with his new pop star persona, he went under the name Hurricane Smith, a much more dynamic sound in Monica than normal, with a song he'd written called Don't Let It Die. The song that eventually became his first solo hit in 1971 actually started life as a song he'd written for John Lennon to sing, John had apparently joked that they were short of songs for the Help album, so Norman decided to pitch in and offer one of his own, that he thought would suit John in particular. The Beatles apparently liked it and gave him some assurance that they were actually going to use it. This was until they realised they hadn't factored in the obligatory Ringo song, which on Help would become Act Naturally. It's rumoured that the Beatles publisher Dick James was a big fan of the song, and offered Norman £15,000 to buy the rights on the spot. Later, spurred on by friend Mickey Most, Norman fronted the song's release himself instead of trying to find an established artist to do it, and the song reached number two in the UK and was a hit around the world. He followed this with Obey What Would You Say, which became a hit in the States. An album quickly followed, along with a few other attempts on the charts as Hurricane Smith, but they failed to reach the same level of success. For a while after this, he bred horses in Surrey but kept his hand in with occasional sessions for Denny Lane of Wings and Moody Blues fame and even played trumpet on Kilimanjaro, the 1980 debut by the Liverpool group The Teardrop Explodes. He later released an autobiography titled John Lennon Called Me Normal and was a regular at Beatles conventions over the years until his death in 2008. 
His career will long be remembered and his place in rock and roll history very much assured. <laughs> 